Okay, so, so nice to introduce the next talk. Very happy. Uh, Sean Davidson, they will talk about exosomes and cardiac health and disease. Please, Sean. Here. Yeah. I said it a lot. I said it. Okay. All right, thanks a lot, Gemma. Uh, so, um, as Gemma mentioned, I'll be talking about uh, exosomes and um, what they are and their role in cardiac health and disease. So I just wanted to show this because um, you, I'm sure you, most people have heard of exosomes like these days. Stem Pardon? Looks like stem cells. <laughs> Perhaps. Um, but the point I want to make is that um, although there's uh, a lot of research and publication on exosomes, this, you can see the part in yellow up the top, that's exosomes in cardiovascular research, and it's still quite a small, relatively small area, um, and still a lot we don't know about the role of exosomes in the cardiovascular area. So what I want to talk a bit about is to tell you what exosomes are, how we isolate and characterize exosomes, what do they do, and I'm going to focus specific, specifically on their um, acute cardioprotective function uh, from ischemia reperfusion. And in the second lecture, yes, I think we'll probably speak more about, about longer-term um, effects. So what are exosomes? Um, there are various lipid-based um, membrane vesicles which are released from cells, which I've shown here. So Microvesicles tend to be released by shedding off the plasma membrane of cells. Exosomes are released from, well, they form inside these uh, in early endosomes by the budding of the membrane. They form inside um, these vesicles. And then we, uh, they accumulate in what are called multiparticular bodies, which we can see when they fuse with the plasma membrane, they'll release their contents. And at that stage, they're referred to as exosomes. Uh, and then there are all other types of vesicles as well, such as apoptotic bodies, which we should be aware of, which are generally larger. Um, but the important thing is once these are released and once we isolate them, it's not so easy to, de to determine whether it's really an exosome or a microvesicle. So they, they have similar size. The um, exosomes tend to be smaller. But um, so a better term is to call, refer to them as extracellular vesicles once they are isolated or EVs, or perhaps uh, small EVs. And, and I'll use some... Um, I'll, I'll use exosomes for shorthand, but really that I'm referring to small extracellular vesicles in many cases. And I, I think the, uh, where they've caught the imagination and a lot of interest is, as you can see, they package proteins and microRNAs um, from the cytosol, um, as are microvesicles, but exosomes tend to have, appear to have a, a specific packaging mechanism where they package specific proteins and microRNAs. So we can, they were, They've been known, um, their existence has been known for many years, actually. This uh, EM micrograph on the left is from 1985 publication, um, released with these small vesicles from the reticular, reticular sites here. Um, but they were generally ignored for a long time and just thought of as debris. Um, when these are isolated and dried down for um, electron microscopy by this negative staining technique, they have this appearance, that's what's, what's referred to as a... Um, a cup-shaped vesicle. They look more like uh, probably collapsed um, big inflatable balls, which is what they are actually. If we look at a, a um, cryo electron micro micrograph, we can see they're actually spherical in, in solution. And it's just when they're dried down, they have this appearance. And I emphasize this, their appearance, because actually um, in the literature, you see often many types of appearance of exosomes. And I'm not always sure that uh, people are actually looking at exosomes. And Specifically, it's, they're often mistaken for lipoproteins, which are small, round, um, and have a similar appearance by negative staining. Um, so it is not always easy to um, know specifically what we're using. I'll show you shortly how we identify exosomes, though. Um, so one way is, as I mentioned, their size. These exosomes tend to be small, 50 to 150 nanometers in diameter. So I'd, I'd, I don't know if anyone knows the wavelength of light. How, are, these, are these smaller than the wavelength of light, would you say, or, or larger? Smaller? smaller. So yeah, actually smaller than the wavelength of light. So that illustrates how it, difficult it is to visualize them directly. Um, we can see them as spots, but we can't see their, determine their size using um, fluorescence microscopy. So the, the technique which is commonly used is uh, nanoparticle tracking analysis, or NTA. And you can see um, this nanosite equipment, which is um, frequently used. The way this works, basically, is, as you can see in this figure, it shines a laser obliquely through the sample. And um, then a high-sensitivity camera looks at the reflected light, uh, makes a, a movie of that. So we have these moving dots 
It's a bit like if you imagine light shining through the window and you have the dust particles moving around. That's what we see. And from the movement of the particles, it's like Brownian motion. The smaller particles move around a lot. The larger particles will move more slowly. So the software can calculate the size of the individual particles and give you a size distribution, as you see here. Um, these are some samples isolated from blood, and actually you can see there are some small, uh, larger particles in there as well, which might be more microvesicles, although the bulk are around the exosome-sized region. And we can validate this using other techniques. In fact, it's a good idea to validate it. Here's using uh, electron microscopy, the uh, EM image, we can um, look at the size of the individual particles as well and confirm that. So overall, there are a series of techniques which are recommended to confirm that what you're isolating are really exosomes. And you can see this in these um, recommendation articles and position papers. And I do advise people to read, actually read these and look at the advice, because this is what um, researchers in the area recognize as important things to, which define exosomes. So the most important then, well, one of the most important is the size and morphology. As I mentioned, you can use NTA or electron microscopy or other techniques. It's a good idea to use at least two of these techniques to show that there are small particles there. One thing I didn't mention about the NTA, though, is that it doesn't tell you these are exosomes. It just tells you, tells you these are small particles, um, which is very important. And there are many other types of small particles, lipoproteins being one, or even just dust particles, which are the same, look, can look the same size, which is why you need other techniques. Marker proteins, which are involved in exosome release and um, containing exosomes, I've listed some of these here. These are called tetraspanin tetra molecules, these particular ones, uh, CD9, CT63, CD81, HSP70 is present in exosomes. So by showing the presence of these, we can see that there are um, exosome proteins there. Um, and you can use uh, different techniques, ELISA or Western blotting. It's not always using, easy using Western blotting because the, the yields can be quite small. These are really tiny particles, and until you start working with them, you don't realize how difficult it is to get enough to, for, for Western blotting techniques, uh, etc. Um, and then it's important to look at the purity. Um, I'll mention the different techniques which we can use to isolate exosomes. And generally, it's advised to avoid precipitation methods as they're relatively impure. Um, and it's a good idea to show that there's minimal um, levels of contamination by microvesicles or albumin or lipoproteins, depending on your sample. So we initially look, were interested in exosomes which, which were present in blood. And um, this is actually, we realize with time, quite challenging due to the, um, the as Manuel mentioned yesterday, the huge amount of proteins which are present in, um, in blood and other types of uh, vesicles and um, lipoproteins, etc. So this diagram illustrates the size range of exosomes, microvesicles being a bit larger, and um, the density as well. And you can see, in particular, the lipoproteins overlap to some degree with the size range and density range of particles. And if you look at the, um, what's, um, it's difficult to get an accurate measure, but what's believed to be the concentration of exosomes in or small extracellular vesicles in the blood, it's around 10 to the 8, 10 to the 10 per mil. So that sounds like a huge amount, you know, billions of these particles per mil. And actually, it's um, when we look at the numbers of platelets, um, I don't know if anyone knows what the normal platelet count is. Probably some clinicians here can say what a typical platelet count is. 150 million yeah, two per um, microliter. Right, that's per microliter. So there's actually it's a similar size um, range, concentration range of platelets in the blood, even though they're you know, larger than um, these vesicles and are a major source of vesicles as well. Um, but the lipoprotein particles, these are actually present in even higher concentrations. And it's just, I think it's uh, fascinating to imagine that there, there are trillions of these particles within a mill, and it's hard to visualize sometimes and get a concept of how many of these tiny particles there can be. But that il also illustrates the challenge of trying to isolate what's present in much lesser quantity. And also, as I mentioned, massive amounts of albumin and other proteins present in the blood, which we have to try and get rid of as well. So these are sort of some of the main techniques of exosome isolation, which um, are commonly used. 
precipita precipitation methods such as um, exequic, you often see them. They're still very common and popular methods, um, possibly because of the name exequic. That sounds nice. Ex exosomes quickly, very nice and convenient. Uh, yeah, <laughs> exodirty. There could be another name. Um, yeah, um, I mean they, they do isolate exosomes, but they tend to precipitate other um, many of the proteins and things as well. And as I said, are not generally recommended, although they are commonly used. Um, the oops. Oh yeah. So the um, what is very commonly regarded as the uh, gold standard, or I said said to be the gold standard of isolation. Um, for some years has been called uh, the differential ultracentrifugation, which I'll go into detail in the next slide. But basically this, um, the idea is to remove the larger cells and larger things and then by differential centrifugation um, precipitate the um, small extracellular vesicles, mainly exosomes. Um, in the last five or six years maybe density, oh, sorry, size exclusion chromatography has got more popular as well. And this essentially um, the technique is based on the size, so the smaller particles and proteins and things will um, go through the beads and take longer to come through the column, where the larger particles, such as exosomes, will pass straight through. And uh, that can be an effective means of separation. Uh, the density gradient that I, stepped, uh, that I skipped uh, is sometimes used to increase the um, purity. As, I, as you saw, they've got a different density from the other particles, so that can help to increase the purity of the isolation, though it tends to reduce the yield as well and adds a lot of extra steps. It's not always convenient. And immunity affinity I put here, that's sometimes used, but um, the yield tends to be very low and it can be quite challenging as well to get high yields. So this is the, what we, this is the uh, gold standard method, if you like, which was developed by uh, Cotille Terry in 2006, or developed before, but she published the method which is commonly referred to. And you can see it's been cited now nearly two and a half thousand times. So if you want to get a high uh, citation paper, that's a, one way is to get a popular method um, published and then referred to. But um, it's useful to have this reference standard because then people can all use at least a similar method of isolation. So. Um, as I said, we were interested in isolating initially from plasma. We were using the differential ultracentrifugation method initially. Uh, we've also looked more recently at the size exclusion chromatography. Um, and from these techniques, we can isolate particles which we find by NTA in the size of extracellular vesicles. So we actually looked at uh, comparing these different methods. Like, like many people, we've, as we get into the field, we realize actually we need to um, look at these methods and see are we really isolating um, exosomes and which is the best method. So we, here we've compared isolation using size exclusion chromatography and differential ultracentrifugation. And initially this uh, SEC looks very good. We get a very high number of particles, much more than the ultracentrifugation. Great, we've got a very high yield. That looks promising. Um, but when we look at the purity, and this is measuring the quantity of the tetraspanin mar marker protein. So exosome-specific markers relative to total protein, actually the ultracentrifugation is a lot more pure, suggesting we're getting contamination of something in the SEC, um, uh, in SEC method. And actually, uh, it's not surprising when we think about this um, sensibly, that the uh, lipoproteins, of course, because they are in the si large size range, some of them overlapping with uh, Exocellular vesicles, they precipitate as well. Uh, and um, by size exclusion, will separate with the exosomes. Yeah? I think, well, APOB will cover most of the uh, lipoproteins. Or the, uh, well, we are in. Yeah. Yeah, I realize. We were looking more at the, um, the ones which were overlapping. Yeah. HDL, yeah. That's true. Uh, uh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so we were discussing the lipoprotein yeah. contamination, and in the ultracentrifuge sample, I think it would be good to test for APOE1, because uh, in our experience, uh, I think the ultracentrifuge exosomes have the highest HDL contamination. Yeah. Um, that's, that's a possibility. 
Yeah, they're the, the most dense, so they're easier to centrifuge. Yeah. Um, so we can see by the electron micrograph as well that uh, clearly we have um, contamination of lipoproteins um, more in the SEC. Um, the other point I wanted to make here is that uh, we, it's important to use plasma for these isolations because uh, in serum preparation we get activation of the platelets, and platelets are a major source of uh, exosomes and vesicles, and they'll just turn out tons of these vesicles if we don't uh, prevent their activation. Um, so we did also compare the um, contents, just looking at some of the angiogenic factors by both methods, and interestingly they're quite similar between the, the both, both of them. So this, um, these experiments, we were looking at exosomes um, present in the blood, or um, primarily originating from erythrocytes and um, um, also from the endothelium and platelets as well. But um, exosomes are produced by just about every cell type, it seems, and there's been a lot of interest in um, their production from stem cells in particular. And we, later on, I'll show you, we've been looking at that a little bit as well, although initially we focused just on the ones present in plasma. Um, so what do exosomes actually do and what's, why such interest in them? Uh, the, the data which has been published suggests that they have various different effects, that they can have immunosuppressive effects um, via effects on macrophages in particular and, and T cells. They can stimulate angiogenesis in, um, and endothelial proliferation and migration. They can decrease fibrosis. Um, and also what we are particularly interested in is their effects in activating acute cardioprotection in myocytes or in hearts. And it's been suggested that they have these um, multiple different effects, possibly because they have different um, mechanisms of action. They contain, as I mentioned, proteins and microRNA. And they also have um, proteins on their surface. They can potentially interact with receptors and perhaps be a, a um, multi-target uh, cardioprotective agent with these multiple different effects, a bit of a Swiss army knife, if you like. But this depends, of course, on whether exosomes can really get taken up into uh, the target cells, in particular myocytes or whatever cell type you're interested in. And although this is widely studied, it's actually not that easy to show. And this is, uh, I'd like to show a bit of a cautionary tale here because it's important to always look at uh, these techniques and see how effective they really are. Uh, one of the very common techniques for looking at tracing and uptake of, of exosomes and uh, vesicles is to use a lipophilic dye such as uh, PKH67 or, or 27 or we've used cell mask, we use both dyes in these experiments. And I'd like to show you what happens when you try to use these to trace um, exosomes. So these are just lipophilic dyes, they're fluorescent. Um, because they're lipophilic, they should bind into the membrane of the vesicles, or they do bind into the membrane of the vesicles. And that way, when you put them onto the recipient cells, you should be able to trace them by fluorescence and see them going into the recipient cell. Okay, great. So in these experiments, just as an, um, I'll show you one of the examples here. We've just taken um, serum, basically, which, as I mentioned, contains lots of exosomes from platelets and um, different sources. We labeled that using the, the dye, um, the fluorescent dye, and put that directly onto cells. And then we got a huge uptake, huge transfer of the fluorescence. Um, okay, so fair enough. But um, actually, if we took exosome-free serum, which we'd either bought, purchased, or prepared ourselves, removing the exosomes, labeled that, you get also a huge transfer of the dye. And from what I've said previously, you might already be anticipating why that is. Um, these lipophilic dyes, this is what they look like, they have long tails which bind into lipids. So they bind very avidly into lipoproteins. And of course, there's tons of lipoproteins in serum. And it's the same problem if you culture your cells in serum. Um, you have serum present, you have lots of lipoproteins. Dyes and things will bind into lipoproteins just as well as vesicles. Now, sorry, uh, so it gets worse than that. These dyes actually don't bind just to lipids. Many of them bind to proteins as well. And if we take just pure protein, um, here I've shown with BSA, but we've done it also with conditioned medium um, proteins, and we use BSA, label the BSA only with the fluorescent dye and look at uptake into cells, we get a, also a very bright signal. And I said, as, as I mentioned, these dyes are very commonly used to show uptake into cells, but without proper controls, it's virtually impossible to, 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 to determine whether it's really being transferred by exosomes. 
Um, so these problems, these dyes are non-specific. They, they can release, once they're taken, go into cells or membranes, they also come out again, so it's reversible. They form micelles. There's all these various other issues with them, which I'd just like to, to highlight, because often people use them without using appropriate controls. Um, so how do we trace exosome uptake then? I'm not going to go into a lot of detail because it's, it's really, it's quite challenging actually. One method which has been used is to isolate vesicles produced by cells expressing Cre recombinase. Then by delivering these exosomes either in vivo or into cells, the Cre is delivered, uh, will recombine and induce fluorescence in the recipient cell. This is quite challenging, not always easy in, in vivo, but it is, has been shown to be effective. So we at least know that exosomes can transfer proteins and have effects in recipient cells. Um, so I don't have the reference. That was from a PNAS paper a few years ago. And there are other p possible ways of labeling vesicles, such as um, the covalent labeling of, of a fluorescent dye. But in that case, if you're co covalently labeling the membrane, you don't know what other changes you've made to surface proteins, and you don't know how you've affected the function of the exosomes. So these are just really some cautionary tales to illustrate how it can be challenging to work in a new field, a relatively new field, where um, new techniques are being developed and not always fully understood. So coming back to the role of exosomes, um, we are interested in what type of exosomes might be ac acutely cardioprotective. And interestingly, in the literature, um, a lot of people have focused on the stem cell exosomes especially those people coming from stem cell field where stem cells, as you probably know, they're originally hoped to um, either engraft and regenerate or form new myocytes in the heart. That doesn't seem to be the case. Often they you may, might see some benefit in cardiac function after administration of stem cells, um, but it, this is believed to be now more likely due to um, transfer of paracrine factors the cells or factors released from the cells which interact with other cell types and can uh, affect the heart. So th the question is then, do we really need stem cells for this effect? And we've done some studies using the exosomes from isolated from plasma, even though we now recognize perhaps they're not the most pure source. Um, and interestingly, just to co uh, in comparison, in, in terms of exosomes which are not protective, Really, the only ones in the literature which are re commonly shown not to be, have these effects are those isolated from dermal fibroblasts in particular. And I don't think anyone really knows why they should not be protective, whether th where those from stem cells are protective. So I'll show you our data that we published a few years ago using the exosomes isolated from plasma. Um, these studies we did with exosomes from rats or from humans. And here I've shown you the um, acute ischemia reperfusion studies we've done where we've ligated a coronary artery for 30 minutes and then reperfused for two hours. Uh, this is in the open chest uh, rat model of ischemia reperfusion injury. And at the end, we can see the heart. We can see um, by st staining with tetrazoleum chloride, we can see um, the area of infarct, so the dead tissue here. And we can see the area which is ischemic here as well. So we look at the uh, area of um, dead tissue or infarct relative to the area at risk. And we can see in the, um, those rats treated with exosomes, um, these were injected intravenously, and this reduced the size of the infarct size compared to the control. So to a similar extent uh, as in those which were subject to re remote ischemic preconditioning, which um, Gert Hoysch mentioned the other day. So we also used an isolated perfused heart model. This is a Langendorf heart model where the heart is uh, isolated from the rat and perfused. And then we administered the exosomes um, for 15 minutes uh, in this protocol. And this also reduced the infarct size. So it doesn't need to be working on other cell, uh, cells outside of the heart. It seems to work directly on the heart. Uh, and then we also used the isolated cardiac myocyte model to, show, to um, see whether exosomes could protect cells directly. So these are subject to hypoxia and reoxygenation, where we see an uh, increase in cell death um, in the control cells and a dose-responsive um, protective effect with the administration of exosomes. So we're interested in see how these exosomes were cardioprotective. And as I mentioned, uh, exosomes, um, one of the 
mark marker proteins, which is commonly or often present, is HSP70. And uh, HSP70 is an interesting molecule. It's actually one I had been working, I had worked on in my PhD, so I, I knew a bit about it, and was aware that it was a, a, a damp as well, one of these damage-associated molecular pattern molecules, which can activate innate immune um, receptors such as TLR4. So we just started to look at this pathway and see if this might um, be involved in the cardioprotection that we were seeing in cells. We treated the myocytes first uh, with the exosomes and saw an activation of ERK phosphorylation, um, no response to the AKT pathway. And uh, here we've used, repeated the cell survival experiments but using an inhibitor of the ERK pathway or two different inhibitors, actually, UO126 or PD98059. And these both abrogated the protection that we saw with the exosomes. So we did a whole series of, exp of experiments using different inhibitors and Western blots and um, determined that, the ex the, indeed, the exosomal HSP70, um, and we used a neutralizing antibody to HSP70, um, developed by a German group, um, but these, this also neutralized and pre uh, prevented the protective effect. So we believe this is the mechanism by which the plasma exosomes that were isolated are protecting the myocytes. So interestingly, these are, these are all exosomes from healthy individuals, but if, what about those um, from diabetic individuals? And we isolated them from uh, diabetic humans or diabetic rats, and here we use a type two diabetic model called the Gotu Kakazaki rat. As you can see, it's a lean rat, but it's actually diabetic. And first we isolated the exosomes um, and found they looked similar, a similar appearance, but a similar size distribution and concentration in the blood um, de determined by nanocyte. But exosomes from the diabetic individuals were no longer protective in our model. So here's the uh, non-diabetic exosomes, and the diabetic exosomes not protective. And they also seem to be defective in activa activating this um, same protective pathway. We saw less activation of ERK uh, signaling kinase and less phosphorylation of HSP27 down, downstream. So they, these exosomes do con contain HSP70 still, so we're not actually um, certain why this is not activating this pathway. It might be due to a glycation or oxidation or other modification of the molecule which renders it no longer um, uh, act, uh, able to activate this pathway of cardioprotection. But importantly, what if we take um, cells from the diabetic rat and incubate them with exosomes from a non-diabetic rat, then these we find are cardioprotective or in, in the uh, isolated cell model. So they reduce uh, the injury after hypoxia oxygenation. So these, those experiments were done with uh, exosomes isolated from the pure plasma. We wanted to start to look at uh, exosomes from different cell sources and see if they could, um, um, which cells uh, might be responsible for those, those protective exosomes. And uh, in these studies we started looking at the endothelial cells. Um, these are just done with uh, HUVEX cells, but we um, isolated the exosomes from, from their culture and um, treated myocytes for uh, 45 minutes and then subject them to, again, the simulated ischemia or hypoxia and reoxygenation and measure the amount of cell death. So first of all, I just, um, just to briefly say, we characterized the exosomes, showed we isolated them and uh, contained the marker proteins. And then in the hypoxia reoxygenation experiments, we could see that uh, exosomes isolated from HUVEX cells were also cardioprotective. So interestingly though, we could um, affect the production or increase the production of exosomes from cells. So uh, in the left experiment, we um, subject the endothelial cells in vitro to an ischemic preconditioning um, type of protocol, a brief hypoxia and reoxygenation. And that increased the rate of exosome production, um, around doubling the production rate. And also if we did that in the isolated perfused heart, um, these were preconditioned and then we measured the um, uh, the vesicles coming out in the um, effluent, and we could see a, a variable but consistent increase in the numbers of exosomes in, after preconditioning. Um, I'll just comment that um, in our hands at least, um, we don't um, see evidence for um, 
that the exosomes contribute to remote preconditioning. Um, I won't go into the detailed discussion of it, but at least the um, when we take exosomes from um, the blood of rats, which are either control rats or those which have been remotely preconditioned, we find that both of them are actually protective. And it doesn't seem to greatly uh, um, affect the protective ability of the exosomes. So more recently, we've been trying to improve our isolation and um, purity of exosomes. And also, um, in these studies, we've been looking at a, a source of uh, stem cell or MSC-like um, stem cell or stromal cell um, as a source of uh, cardioprotective exosomes. And uh, we're not the, on the only group. I realize there are some, um, there's a group here who have a poster on their amniotic uh, fluid stem cells as well. But, um, and this is in collaboration with the group at uh, UCL who isolate these uh, AFSCs um, from perinatal amniocentesis. So they're a relatively um, accessible source of MSC cells. Um, and we were interested to see whether uh, their exosomes which they produce can also be protective. Um, one of the reasons for looking at these particular MSC cells is that unlike those from adult cells, they, or in comparison to them, um, they express higher levels of pluripotency markers. This has been shown, uh, for example, here. And there is some evidence that they might have increased functionality as well. This is the MSC cells. And they also have high ex uh, potential for expansion, so they can be um, grown for quite a long time. So in these experiments, to avoid some of the issues with um, serum and um, interference by serum components, we culture them for two days in serum-free conditions. Now, obviously, this introduces some other questions about how does serum-free conditions influence the cells. Um, and so these are the pros and cons that you have to uh, look at with working with exosomes. It's, we want to isolate the more pure vesicles, so we isolate them in serum-free conditions, but that might potentially affect the uh, exosomes which they produce. So we did confirm that this two days of serum-free culture doesn't affect uh, the levels of cell death significantly. And the cells still um, can differentiate and express the same markers and look to all uh, intensive pur purposes very similar. We then used a size exclusion chromatography to isolate the exosomes. And since we don't have lipoproteins present there, we get a much better isolation and purity of the um, exosomes or SEVs. So you can see, looking at the different fractions, we've got a very good separation between the protein and the SEVs in the earlier fractions. This is by nanocyte looking at the um, numbers of particles, or, or by measuring the protein in this case. But also, when we look at the uh, levels of these tetris bannon markers by uh, ELISA in this case, we can see they're all eluting, um, all coming out here in the fraction where we see the, uh, the small particles, as we would hope. So we believe we have a nice, pure preparation of exosomes. We can see by electron microscopy they have this expected shape and uh, a size range, although again we have a slightly larger, some larger particles in there as well, which is why I've referred to them as SEVs rather than exosomes generally. So then we wanted to see if these are cardioprotective and we used a, a mouse model of ischemia reperfusion here and um, importantly we, these were performed blinded um, the uh, person doing the experiments was just given the tubes, randomized, and didn't know which one was watched, for, which, which one was which, for the analysis as well. Because we wanted to be really sure that these uh, vesicles are actually protective. And as you can see, we saw a significant reduction in the infarct size um, uh, with administration of the SEVs just before reperfusion. Uh, that was, we used bradykinin as a positive control here because we um, know this is very protective in this model. So we started to look a bit at the uh, mechanism for how these um, might be protective, and uh, we did like what many people do, is do some proteomics to look what proteins are present. Um, I won't go into the details, but just to mention some of the most um, highly uh, significant processes, as you might expect, uh, were also, also all involved in vesicle uh, release and vesicle transport. In fact, we didn't learn a great deal from this, because um, even where we have um, perhaps neutral activation, you might think in initially, how do, how do we have neutral activation involved in, in these cells because these are not neutrophils? But actually, neutrophils are very highly, um, they release a lot of vesicles. So I think that's why these.
uh, comes up as a recognized process as well. Uh, we also looked at the, um, we were interested in whether they activated some of the um, androgenic um, stimulation and whether they contained androgenic proteins. Um, by protein array, we could see they contained a lot of um, uh, pro-angiogenic stimulating cytokines and factors. Um, and then we used a uh, HUVEC migration model to see whether that actually stimulated the migration of the HUVEC cells. And we can see a nice dose response here within, in the presence of the exosomes that stimulated their migration. So we, interestingly, the, um, I mean, the cells release a lot of different proteins and, and paracrine factors, et cetera, in addition to exosomes. So we wanted to see what component uh, or what degree of the migration is actually due to the ex exosomes or SUVs. So we took the conditioned medium from the cells, removed the SUVs, and found that that basically eliminated the uh, induction of angiogenesis or mig migration, endothelial migration. So it seems that the SUVs are responsible for the majority of the migration, migratory stimulation of the conditioned medium from these cells. And to look a bit at the mechanism we were looking in, um, we used a PFE kinase inhibitor. Um, here we shouldn't have any effect on its own, but reduced uh, the migration. So it seems, seems to be some of these um, factors in combination are probably activating PFE kinase and stimulating migration of the endothelial cells. Um, so that work which I've said there is uh, still a work in progress. We're still looking at uh, what the actual mechanism of protection of the AFSC exosomes are. Um, but what I want, the point I wanted to make is that uh, really the, the isolation method that you choose is very important and has to be adapted to what um, uh, type of liquid you're using, whether it's uh, be the um, blood or plasma or the um, conditioned medium. So we've seen that um, when we uh, isolate plasma SUVs by ultracentrifugation, they're cardioprotective via this pathway. Uh, and this is impaired by diabetes or hy hyperglycemia. Endothelial cells in culture can produce cardioprotective SUVs. Um, but we're trying to look now at what is really the optimal source of um, protective uh, exosomes. So we've been using these AFSC cells, which produce um, nicely protective um, and, pro and uh, SUVs, which can stimulate angiogenesis. However, the purity of the isovis of the vesicles is always a, an important issue, as well as the methods which you use and how you uh, control those. Um, I haven't talked anything about uh, microRNAs because we've been looking at the acute effects, which we believe is more likely due to the proteins. Um, perhaps Yus might uh, address that a little bit more in his talk. But uh, of course, there's a lot of interest as well as the in the microRNAs contained with exosomes and what um, effects they may have. Although, as I mentioned, whether these really are taken up into cells and, wh and whether they are taken up in quantity sufficient to have an, a, a, an effect on recipient cells is still something we have to really um, confirm. And just finally, I'd like to acknowledge uh, a lot of this work was done by a very good PhD student, Kalyan Takov, in the lab, um, and um, I mentioned my other collaborators there, uh, as well as funders. So thanks a lot for your attention. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Very, very clear and very important because the isolation method is key in the exosome field. Yep. So, any questions from the audience? Perfect. Great talk. Uh, the intention was to use HUVAC as uh, um, a model for cardiac endothelial cells, and if so, do you think it is a good model using uh, human uh, umbilical vein endothelial cells as a model for cardiac endothelial cells? No, you're completely right. I mean, it's a, it's a very simplistic model, but it's one we decided to start using really because it's just they're, they're easily available and, ex and accessible. We would want to confirm that in, in the uh, cardiac endothelial cells as well and in vivo or um, in more physi physiological models. This is really just the first step. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> 
So, okay. Uh, I think using uh, this kind of approach, uh, a simplistic approach in, uh, in the beginning of our studies uh, leads us of, uh, to some results that in the end will not be reproducible just because the model was not quite uh, well. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I mean, this, there's pros and cons of this as well. So we started with this, this model because it's quite reproducible in our hands and very effective. But and now we're using the um, the uh, tube formation assays, and we'll use an in vivo assay of angiogenesis as well, because you need to confirm that in a more physiological model. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, I was just thinking about something that you said that I thought was quite interesting. You said that exosomes, uh, exosomes are generally cardioprotective, but the fibroblast exosomes does not seem to be cardioprotective. Um, you also mentioned that exosomes can decrease fibrosis. Uh, and I was wondering if, because fibrosis is really critical at an early stage that you don't rupture the heart and everything, if, if these exosomes from the fibroblasts could actually decrease fibrosis and maybe they would be more um, helpful at a later stage if you yeah. kind of attenuate the fibrosis. Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, th to be honest, there hasn't been a lot done on the role on, that I'm aware of of exosomes and fibrosis. I just mentioned that as one of the potential effects which has been shown and I'm not really 100% con convinced by the paper either but it's just uh, okay, something to be explored but it's a good very good point maybe it's better to administer them later if you want to inhibit fibrosis I think fibrosis is difficult because it's often a, often a secondary effect in infarction okay I have a question so when using exosomes from cell lines I guess that the content of these exosomes is more homogeneous considering that they come from clones of the same cells yeah However, when working with human exosomes, like those you were saying obtained from amniotic fluid stem cells, uh, how much can the content differ between humans be because of all the genetic background and comorbidities and this kind of stuff? And how important is that to take into consideration, knowing that the protective effect that you were talking about, the acute one, is exerted by the protein content of the exosomes? Exerted by what, sorry? You said that the, the acute protective yeah. effect is from the proteins and the long-term yeah. protective effect is from the microRNAs. Oh, so I mean, that's hypothetical. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, so how important yeah. is it to look into, uh, when, when working with hu human exosomes, to look into the content of, of each of them? I mean, from the yeah. individuals. Um, so in the field, people are gradually becoming aware that actually even exosomes released from one cell type can be heterogeneous. There are different subtypes. They don't all express the same marker proteins even. And it's, um, it's not clear yet whether different subtypes of exosomes have different effects or physiological roles. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's difficult to address, but it's something we, we need to do to try and isolate these different subpopulations or, um, yeah, and see what their effects are. Thank you very much for a really nice talk. I appreciate this careful approach to this uh, difficult question of exosomes. Um, and actually, I have to say, after what you said, uh, my conclusion would be, if you use serum containing or preparations, there is no real gold standard to differentiate between lipoproteins and exosomes. And if that's correct, I wonder uh, how much of the published data and also your own data with these uh, preparations could be explained simply by protective effects of HDL, which is pretty well known. So, and more specifically, did you try, for example, to antagonize S1P? Because S1P is a classic uh, c c compound bound to HDL, which is cardioprotective. Hmm. Well, that's a good idea. We didn't try that, but from what I've uh, read, most of the... Um so there are some examples where lipoproteins have been seen to be protective or HDLs, and um, they seem to be mon mainly via PI3 kinase pathway, whereas we saw protection via ERK pathway and no activation of, of PI3 kinase. So, I mean, that's indirect, but that's my best evidence that it's not uh, via lipoproteins at the moment, I think. Uh, but, is uh, my conclusion correct? That if you use serum containing preparation, it is difficult. Yeah. It re it's, yeah, I should have really stated that there's still, although this is said to be the gold standard, there's no ideal way of getting really of perfectly pure yeah. exosomes. Okay. It is a limitation. Although recently there have been some publications using more advanced techniques such as uh, field flow fractionation, and at least according to these uh, publications, they're much more pure. Um, but it's, it's, they're diff difficult techniques. Um, 
there are other ways of looking at exosomes, or at least trying to quantify them directly in the blood using um, antibodies, for example, antibody recognition or antibody pull-down. But there it's difficult to get yields to use in biochemical cellular experiments. Uh, just to reinforce uh, Thomas' point, so we did uh, proteomics on HDL from 172 patients and then did a bioinformatic analysis and the top scoring pathway was exosomes. And we knew that our HDL was very pure, so what this does tell me is how contaminated the exosome literature is yeah. with lipoproteins. Yeah. Um, and the question, I think, what you addressed is we really need this kind of capture technologies, and the question then is which antigen would you recommend to specifically isolate exosomes? So yeah. what is a good mm -hmm. antigen target? Uh, because I don't think that any of the other techniques can yeah. differentiate between lipoproteins and exosomes. Yeah, so that's where there's been discussion in the field because I mentioned these marker Tetris bannons, but as I was just suggesting, they don't, like CD63 is present on many exosomes, but it's not present on all exosomes. And we don't know if the CD63 exosomes are different from the other exosomes. Probably the best way is to use a panel of, or a collection of anti CD, um, and Tetris bannon molecules, antibodies, pull, down, pull them all down. Or, but there's a lot of work to be done in this field. I, I think a tried to make that point as well. It's still at a very early stage and there's so much we don't know really about their function, partly but due to the poor techniques or difficult but techniques. Because in line with this comment, I want to tell you a thought about the need to standardize this method worldwide because everybody is doing so many analyses yeah. and health and disease and everybody uses different techniques. Yeah. So. so again, in, um, in the EV field, there have been some attempts to try and standardize analysis techniques between laboratories. And you know, it's, it's sometimes a little depressing that when they try and do these, like um, what place autometry experiments, for example, it's very uh, low reproducibility between labs, even with the so same samples. And I mean, there are ongoing um, uh, uh, techniques or um, try, attempts to try and improve this, but it's, it's not easy. Thank you very much.